Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. I would like to start by thanking the DH Lawrence Society, of course, Alan, Brenda, Kate, Glennis, for this invitation to share some of my research on the H. Lawrence with you today. For this, I am really, truly grateful. So, part one, introduction. I would like to start this presentation by quoting Women in Love, page 448. What one does in one's art, that is the breath of one's being. What one does in one's life, that is a bagatelle for the others to fuss about. <laughs> now for an overview of this presentation. I will start with an introduction to set the scene, as it were, in Taormina, Sicily. I will then proceed to give you a quick tour of Casa Cuzeni and what is interesting about this house. After that, I will then discuss the H. Lawrence and Casa Cuzeni, following which I will share thoughts and observations. One of the major places of cultural interest in Taormina, Italy, is Casa Cuzeni. This house is today stop number three in the Taormina Cult Tour, a touristic recommendation from the municipality of Taormina for art and culture lovers. A tour which also features stops at the ancient Greek theater, the historic gardens of Villa Caronia, Villa Monrepo, and the old Taormina Casino. What immediately catches the eye of any Laurentian, and it certainly caught mine, is the emphatic mention of D.H. Lawrence as the first of a list of writers, artists, and philosophers who frequented this house of culture. As Laurentians, it interests us to know more about Loren Lawrence's connection with this house. In this presentation, I will share the information gathered from my summer visit to Taormina and to Casa Cuzeri two years ago during which I interviewed the curator and director of the house, Francesco Spadaro, who was gracious enough to spend the better part of a day with me. He also gave me a personal tour and answered all my questions. What interested me and what I really wanted to find out is whether Lawrence really visited this house as frequently as the touristic advert claimed, and whether there could be anything that might have really interested Lawrence here, enough for him to visit this house repeatedly. Oh, or so they said. Spadaro, the current owner of the house, told me that Lawrence and Frida had stayed there for a few days until they settled in at Fontana Vecchia. To be honest of this, I found no evidence at all, even though there is a gap between 25th of February 1920 when he writes from Capri to Gertrude Cooper, saying that he was going by sea to Sicily from Naples the next day, and he says, We've come into our house this evening on the 8th of March, claiming we all stayed at the Bristol, a very well-known hotel in Taormina, as was the Timeo, another hotel. It is highly unlikely that he might have stayed at Casa Cuzeni at this time. The sources for my research for this presentation were the information given to me by this curator, Francesco Spadaro, the official book published by the Casa Cuzeni Foundation about the house, which is incidentally called The Search for Spirituality in Art, Daphne Phelps' book, A House in Sicily, information very generously given to me by Jim Phelps, Mark Kinkedweek's Triumph to Exile, and of course, most importantly of all, D. H. Lawrence's letters and writings. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Jim Phelps, who was very gracious in sending me many photos he took on his visit to Casa Cuzerni in July 2002. But more about that later. Part two. In my talk today, I would like to take us all to Taormina, Sicily, Italy. The H. Lawrence and Frida arrived in Sicily on the 26th of February 1920 after leaving London and traveling to Italy via Paris, first staying in Piccinisco, then Naples, and for a short while in Capri. After a few days in Giardini, they arrived at, in Fontana Vecchia, Taormina on the 8th of March, 1920. They initially rented the house for a year for 2,000 lire. But as it turned out, they were to spend two years living there from the 8th of March, 1920 to the 20th of February, 1922, traveling extensively for months in between while they were based there. The Fontana Vecchia house had incidentally been built by the Dutch ancestors of Mary Hubre. In a letter to Rosalind Baines on the 15th of March, 1920, from Fontana Vecchia, Taormina, Sicily, Lawrence writes, I feel at last we are settled down and can breathe. 
Capri was all the time like a ship which is going to arrive somewhere and doesn't. Here we are in Sicily. We've got a nice big house with fine rooms and a handy kitchen. Set some dis distance looking east. To the left, the coast of Calabria and the Straits of Messina. It is beautiful and green, green and full of flowers. Capri was a dry rock. I must say, I like this place. There are a good many English people, but fewer than Capri and not so all overish and one needed to know them. It seems so peaceful and still. The earth is sappy and I like the strong Saracen element in the people here. They are thin and dark and quieter. It isn't quite like Europe. It is where Europe ends finally, beyond is Asia and Africa. One realizes somehow how non-European, how Asiatic Greece was tinged with Phoenician. Many of us have visited Sicily and Taormina, but one ought to remember that Taormina, at the time the Lawrences arrived, was very primitive and archaic. By this comment, Lawrence is referring to the Magna Grecia that was Sicily, the high seat of Greece, full of reminders of past European civilizations and perhaps not so European as we know it today. Taormina, which is Greek theatre as Lawrence would have seen it then, identical to how it is today, and the site of the Acropolis in Castelmola, which is a few hundred feet above the house Lawrence and Frida lived in, it is actually a 10 minute bus ride, and I can imagine Lawrence walking it up. And not far, of course, from Taormina is also the Valley of the Temples in Agrigento. Sicily was indeed a connector to the ancient Greco-Roman and secolo arabic secolo norman and Carthaginian past. Now, once the Lawrences settled in, they were soon to realize that a sizable group of mainly European residents lived in Taormina, who Lawrence started befriending and frequenting. There was his old friend, Mary Canaan, Robert Kitson, the English painter, John Wright, Baron Stemple from Baltic Russia, Ros Rosalie Bull, a theosophist, Mabel Hill, the philanthropist, the Duke of Bronte, the Honorable Alexander Nelson Hood, and the American Baldwin. Recently discovered letters to Mary Hubrecht also reveal Lawrence's appetite for local gossip and parish pump affairs. He admired the elegant library and furnishing of Roccabella, in Lawrence's time still owned by Mary Hubrecht and subsequently bought by Baldwin. In between his desire to move on, Lawrence enjoyed life in Darmine and the months spent living there were a period of relative tranquility and contentment for the Lawrences. It certainly contrasted sharply with the tension and torment of the preceding years in England, where he had felt like a fox that is cornered by a pack of hounds and boars who don't perhaps know he's there, but are closing in unconsciously, as he had written to Catherine Castle on the 5th of February, 1917, from Zena, St. Ives in Cornwall. Part three. But what was Casa Cuseni? What was really interesting about this house? To understand why Lawrence visited this house time and time again, reputedly to have tea, we should understand what this house represented. Well, going for tea can have many connotations. Surely this house offered something which was stimulating enough to make him want to go back. And it is this research which I am going to present today. The finest house in Taormina, they called Casa Cuseni when it was finished, a house of honey stucco built by the English artist Robert Kitson in an impossibly romantic Sicilian location. Its grandeur hardly fading with the passing century. Kitson said it was the sun, the sun, and the place itself that inspired me. Robert Horton Kitson was a painter who inherited a huge sum of money following the death of his father, John Horton Kitson, the industrialist in 1899. He arrived in the town in 1900, age 27, with his pale skin, careful coiffure and penetrating blue eyes, he looked every inch the fin de siècle English aesthete. Tarmina, he quickly realized, could satisfy his needs. Its light, beauty and sublime landscape would inspire his painting. Its climate could benefit his rheumatic fever and he could escape the sexual repression of his native England, epitomized by Oscar Wilde's recent trial and detention. In 1910, Kitson chose a site above the ancient village along a winding street, which leads to the Madonna della Rocca Sanctuary on the very outskirts of Taormina, becoming the first foreigner to build outside the medieval walls and earning himself the nickname Il Pazzo Inglese, which means the mad Englishman. Kitson planned and supervised every detail of his project, ensuring his home 
would have a stunning view of the Bay of Naxos and Mount Etna. Those of us who have traveled to other Sicilian locations, such as Palermo, might have seen luscious and luxurious villas and palazzos, such as the one used in the movie Il Gatto Pardo or the opulence of Santa Margherita Belice, the famous summer residence in Donna Fugata. But Casa Cuseni was, and still is, very different to these. I, for one, did not find the same kind of rich Rococo or Baroque opulence as that which can be seen in Ragusa or Palermo. Here was a different kind of richness. Kitson was a painter ironically remembered more for his act of artistic patronage than for any of his own paintings. He was an architect, draftsman, surveyor, engineer, landscape gardener, and interior designer. Although he enlisted some help with the latter from an old friend and mentor, the artist Frank Brangwyn, who had been apprenticed to William Morris. By the time Brangwyn received Kitson's commission, he was working closely with Art Nouveau pioneers in Paris, Munich, and Vienna. Brangwyn was responsible for Casa Cusini's dining room interior, the furniture, paneling, details, and murals. By the time the house was complete, the locals had taken Kitson to, to their hearts. Il Pazzo Inglese gave way to Don Roberto, as they started calling him. Respect was due to the Englishman who showed such commitment to his adoptive home. He was popular too for the innovations he introduced to Taormina, for example, the first private swimming pool, um, which was cited um, with an artist's sensibility and engineer's position to reflect Etna's moonlit slopes, as well as the first motor car in which he helped to ferry the injured during the earthquake of Messina of 1908. The dining room, entirely designed by Brangwyn with delicate paintings on the walls, illustrates the relationship between Robert Kitson and his partner, the Taormina painter Carlo Siligato, including the adoption of little Francesco, orphaned by the earthquake of Messina in 1908. Kitson and Siligato raised Francesco together. I was shown the child's tricycle, a futurist style creation, which you can see in this photo. Troops of guests came to Taormina to visit Don Roberto and Carlo Siligato, as the locals now knew them. He was so loved by the locals that years later, during the occupation of Taormina by the fascists, the house, which was replete with Sicilian, European and Oriental artifacts, such as 2000 year old Hellenistic pieces, Middle Eastern prayer rugs, old Persian pottery and artworks of great artistic value, also linked to the land, were literally saved by the locals. The story goes that an escorted high official, a representative of the fascist police, presented themselves at the house one day to inform Kitson that they would be returning the next morning and would be confiscating the entire contents of the house, which would then be used by the fascist troops as an office base and residence for officials. Now word reached the village through the housekeeper and other staff members of the house, people who loved Don Roberto for the generosity he had demonstrated throughout his stay in Taormina. The members of staff rallied round most of the village who formed the human chain. And in a matter of hours, they had emptied the house of much loved artworks and artifacts, which were then hidden meticulously in the houses of the villages all across the Armina. A few of the artworks were even buried in the garden of the house. And in one particular case, a rose plant planted over, while in another, a box of treasures was hidden, suspended in one of the wells in the garden. For this reason, a few members of the Kitson's house staff voluntarily offered with some insistence on keeping a watchful eye on the house throughout the occupation of their own free will, under the premise of offering the services as gardeners, cleaners and watchmen. In reality, these locals were guarding the hidden artifacts which were hidden all over the grounds. The interior of the house did strike me as beautiful with the murals painted by Brangwyn, furniture handcrafted in the arts and crafts style, in the study and library, I was shown many books by Bertrand Russell, known as Bertie De, Ezra Pound, Tennessee Williams, D. H. Lawrence, and Henry Faulkner. The curator was just pulling books out to show me how many modernist writers, artists, and philosophers had signed their copies for Kitson. Names of friends and guests of Kitson's who visited him in Taormina rolled off his tongue. There was Oscar Wilde and the later notorious German photographer, Wilhelm von Glöden, whose bound book of photographs, mostly of scantily clad young men, I was shown in the dining room. The artist Julian Trevelyan and his future wife, Mary Fedden. 
His father, Bob, had probably introduced kids into Taormina, where a Trevelyan aunt had settled many years before. And his cousin, Rally, became a regular visitor. Gay Lord Hauser took the house and reputedly entertained Greta Garbo. The Russells came as did the novelist Jocelyn Brooke, Dane Janet Vaughan, and other Somerville College alumni. Alison Monroe of Arabia and Janet Adam Smith and Robina Addis of the World Federation for Mental Health. Dennis Mack Smith of All Souls College, Oxford, drafted his history of Sicily at Casa Cuzzeni. Bob McRae of Toronto University drafted his study of John Stewart Mill there. Kitson lived happily in Casa Cuzzeni for more than 40 years. When he died in 1947, he passed it to his niece, Daphne Phelps, who took over and lived there until her death in November 2005 equally loved by the locals and her staff. Jim Phelps very kindly sent me some photos of himself with Daphne, a relative of Jim's, on his visit to Tarmina in 2002, on occasion of her 90th birthday, three years and four months before her death. In Kitson's day, the house was a hub for Tarmina society, probably the nearest the town had to a literary and artistic salon. Daphne Phelps somewhat inadvertently continued this tradition since the only way she could afford to keep the house was by taking paying guests, among them Bertrand Russell, Henry Faulkner, Tennessee Williams, Roald Dahl, Pablo Picasso, Salvador Dali, Dylan and Kate Thomas, not together by the way, they traveled separately, Truman Capote, Bertrand Russell and Greta Garbo. Casa Cuzzeni was reputed to have been built on the site of a Greek villa or temple. I quote Daphne Phelps from her book, A House in Sicily, in which she writes, the first time the renowned archeologist Dino Adamestienu visited Casa Cuzzeni, he recognized a number of objects found in the garden as Greek artifacts, a small face with a cheerful expression made to amuse a child, an Eve with a lion's head typical of Mania Grecia, an intact amphora, the pedestal of a small domestic altar and three Greek wells still in good working order today a terracotta horse head, which must have been part of an Acroteria decoration group. And to the neighboring Greek Acropolis, the very ancient history of the site may be dated to at least the fourth century BC. Of course, the Greeks would have had a villa here. They wouldn't have missed this view. This site and that of the Greek theater are the best in Taormina. In an Italian newspaper, as I recently found, an article alleging that Dino Adamestienu and Daphne Phillips had had an amorous affair. The article stated on his death, 43 love letters written by Daphne Phelps were found, still bound in a red ribbon sent between 1954 and 1956, which indicated a sweet love story between the child neuropsychiatrist Daphne Phelps and the great Romanian archeologist had occurred in the 50s, while Phelps had hosted him during the excavations of the ancient walls and caves, caves of Jela. Back inside the house, I found the sitting room elegant enough, as was the baby grand piano, which the curator claimed had entertained illustrious groups of thinkers, artists, and writers. In this photo, we can actually see Andrea Bocelli at the piano on one of his many visits. However, I was not at all convinced of anything that could remotely fascinate Lawrence until I was taken outside. That is where I started to understand what Lawrence may have found attractive. We were told that the tour of the outside involved the garden of, of no less over no less than 10 levels or te, a 10 terraced tiered garden. The first kind of opulence one encounters in the garden of Villa Cuzzeni um, is in the flora and garden design. It is a very particular design which despite being split over so many levels as a sort of garden built in layers or terraces is so rich and lush that the 10 levels certainly are not so obvious even from the outside. Walls are covered in bougainvilleas and jasmines. There are various types of stone receptacles, urns, vases, small ponds full of Egyptian papyrus, beds of red and pink geraniums, blue wisteria and sunflowers. The entrance on the first level was designed in pure art deco style by Brangwen and is the beginning of an esoteric part leading to the next level, decorated by none other but the futurist Fortunato de Pero. At the entrance is an esoteric symbol created by another important futurist artist, Giacomo Balla, where we find the first pool where one can immerse oneself for a ritual bath. On the second level garden is a pagan and Roman two-faced Janus 
representation by futurist de Pero, as well as floral decorations dating to 1914. On the fourth level, created for meditation, are two large seats, one in an Art Deco style, one in the Futurist style, seen here with the latter designed by Giacomo Balla in 1914, one year before the publication of the Manifesto of the Futurist Reconstruction of the Universe. It is believed that the Futurist movement had its initial traces precisely here in the Casa Cuisini Garden, the only testimony to the presence of Futurist art in Sicily. On the seventh level, is a cuspidate architecture, a tribute to the neo-Gothic architecture of Augustus Pugin, a link between the pre-Raphaelites and medieval forms adopted by William Morris and his student Brangwen. On this level, we also find sculptural form, a futurist fountain, embodying all the requirements of futurism, and then the futurist manifesto on behalf of the futurist Balla, Severini, Boccioni, Carra, one year prior to the futurist reconstruction of the universe manifesto, Balla wrote, we will combine elements of the abstract dynamic, multimaterial and movement in motion together according to the whims of our inspiration to create plastic complexes that we shall set in motion. In 1913, on the eighth level, Sir Frank Brangwen designed a fountain which was inspired by the Maison de l'Art Nouveau in Paris since he had been selected together with Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec to design the stained glass windows for Comfort Tiffany's company. Now on the eighth level, we find King Solomon's temple, a Kabbalah immense Kabbalistic construction, perhaps never actually realized, but highly important on an experimental level. A place distinct from the profane external space, architecturally structured to represent the true order of the universe in its spatial and temporal dimensions. In this case, rather than being represented in a cave, as in the Mitraic mysteries, or in a city such as Jerusalem, or in a tower such as a ziggurat, here we have it in a garden. The system of self-purification is based on the design of the Vitruvian man. The drawing is based on the correlations of ideal human proportions with geometry described by the ancient Roman architect Vitruvius in book three of his treatise De Architectura. Vitruvius described the human figure as being the principal source of proportion among the classical orders of architecture. Leonardo da Vinci's drawing is traditionally named in order of this architect. The path to the return of divine or the Kabbalistic mystical Judaic is a tree of life design used to describe the cosmology of certain schools of mystical Jewish belief, the creation of the universe and humanity and the part of the return to the divine. The design represents the manner in which the Sephiroth manifestations of the divine understood to psychological forms, manifest both light and vessels from the light of the infinite source. So here we are seeing the artistic creation of the detailed alchemical symbology and sacred shapes designed by none other than the futurist Giacomo Balla in 1914. On the tenth level, Brangwen creates a migveh, a bath for ritual immersion into which rainwater collects naturally. This is the place where fire meets water and air, where all the art forms and styles come together. The flame design is highly futuristic in style designed by Giacomo Balla, and the spool collects rainwater to distribute to the pools found below, where one may bathe before entering the temple of King Solomon or participating in the celebrations. The water supply system consists of a series of fountains and cisterns designed on an intricate mathematical study of Pitsons to identify the precise location for the full moon to produce the splendid spectacle of Etna to be mirrored on the surface of the water. The architects, Sir Alfred East and Cecil Hunt, apart from using the Etna and the Gulf of Naxos as the principal actors on the scene, also created a menorah, a temple of King Solomon, and three baths or pools for ritual purification. The pillars of the pool are reminiscent of the drawings of Jesse King, designer for Liberty and Co., the company founded by Sir Arthur Lazenby, Liberty, a, cold, a close friend of Sir Alfred East and Robert Kitson. The large rainwater collection basin was built on the 10th level in pure aesthetical design, incorporating arts and crafts, art nouveau, futurism, mythology, and above all, pure theosophist styles. This is all the work of Giacomo Balla. The composition layout of the building is based on the use of clear symmetries in the plan. 
and the sequence of openings and the opposing flights of stairs connecting the large terraces reminiscent of Palladio's repertoire. The garden outside is a symbiotic synthesization of futurist and esoteric philosophy and design. Giacomo Balla was perhaps the most charismatic member of the Futurists, who together with Fortunato de Pero signed the Manifesto of the Futurist Reconstruction of the Universe, which proposed to recreate the universe by using one's artistic imagination for everything created by man. Hence, Tarmina was established as the headquarters of the avant-garde of the first 20 years of the 20th century, and certainly one of the most important artistic and intellectual sites for the germination of European culture. Taormina hosted the Futurist Avant-Garde as early as 1916. The house was then chosen in April 1928 for the first Sicilian exhibition of decorative arts. Four works have been certified as authentic and original works by Futurists Balla and De Pero. So having just read Andrew Harrison's seminal book, The H. Lawrence and Italian Futurism, A Study of Influence, and having had just been to Milan to see the Museum del Novecento, where many futurist works are housed, I was certainly impressed that this garden was a sort of open-air futurist museum. Casa Cuseni was a space of resistance and social manifestation of solidarity and defiance against the hege hege hegemony of English capitalism and imperialism of the late 19th century, of which Robert Kitson, the builder and first owner of the villa, was one of the best known heirs. It was also a privileged place for theosophical practice and meditation. Throughout its ancient history, this garden has been a place to discuss and seek out solutions to the great themes of life and the world, a privileged place for philosoph philosophical practice and the vehicle for disseminating knowledge, not unlike the Platonic Academy or Aristotle's Lyceum, the Garden of Epicurus and the Sinosarges Gymnasium. This garden is a utopia, an escape from reality, an alchemical vision of life, a spiritual trail, the beginning of an esoteric pathway to reach knowledge of the self rather than that of the ego. Part four. I searched in Lawrence's letters for evidence of his visits to Casa Cuseni and reference to his friendship with Robert Kitson. In a letter to Mary Hubrecht on the 21st of June, 1920, Lawrence describes Kitson as the last of the migrants and he leaves on Wednesday. We have been to see him and he seems quite nice, but no more than that. This indicates that Lawrence and Frida had visited Kitson at Casa Cuseni. Francesco Spadaro informed me that in a compendium of letters written by D.H. Lawrence in Taormina, translated into Italian in a book called Fuori dalle Ombre, D.H. Lawrence, El Italia del Sud, which translates into English, Out of the Shadows, D.H. Lawrence and Southern Italy, by the company called uh, La Conchiglia, the seashell, there is a letter written by Lawrence in which he says that when he got to know Kitson, Rangwin was working on the murals for the library. Spadaro also mentioned that Kitson might have appeared too English and too sophisticated for Lawrence's tastes. On the 8th of November 1920 to Mary Hubert, Lawrence writes, Kitson came to tea yesterday, our only visitor. On the 12th of November 1920, Lawrence writes to Mary Canaan, we have suddenly dashed into society or been popped in by Kitson, which indicates that they had, been, they had befriended him sufficiently for him to want to make them part of the Taormina expat crowd. In this same letter, he writes, Kitson goes to Egypt, which indicates that Lawrence and Kitson were certainly close enough and in touch to know of each other's travel plans. Lawrence mentioned many characters who formed part of this expatriate crowd in Taormina in his letters, but I will omit these details here as it is not the scope of this paper. In fact, on the 16th of December, 1920, he writes to Hubert, we see a few people, Kitson, Rosalie Bull, Baudouin, which indicates a degree of regularity. In his letter to Francis Brett Young on the 27th of January, 1921, Lawrence mentions that Jan Yuta and Alan Insole were in Taormina visiting Spain at the Villa San Patrazio until the 30th of January, a visit during which Yuta discussed with Lawrence his illustrations for Sea and Sardinia and also painted Lawrence's portrait there. In the same letter, Lawrence writes, we went to a little fancy dress ball last night, not dressed, me and my same as ever old grey jacket to hell with them. And such a pitiable display of ridiculous imbecility 
you needn't wish to see. The next we hear of Kitson is on the 16th of November, 1921, 10 months later, when Lawrence writes to Earl Brewster, I had a bit of flu, so haven't been out much. Kitson was here, which indicates that the friendship between Kitson and Lawrence had developed sufficiently for Kitson to visit Lawrence during his convalescence. However, much to my dismay, I did not even find one instance where Lawrence mentions Casa Cuzani. We might be allowed the liberty to conclude that when the Lawrences visit Kitson, they visit him at his house, but it is very curious, not to mention disappointing, that Lawrence does not mention the house at all. He mentions other stately homes in Taormina, but not Casa Cuzani. Despite Kitson's hospitality and his encouragement for the Lawrences to take part in social activities generated by the well-educated and generally affluent expatriates, such as the fancy dress ball just mentioned, Kitson's public school background and his having graduated from Trinity College, Cambridge, which was also the college Bertrand Russell went to, did not wholly endear him to Lawrence. Mabel Hill's earnest piety was perhaps sometimes disagreeable to Lawrence, and he mocked the pretensions of the Duca de Bronte, who was actually the Honorable Alexander Nelson Hood, who invited Lawrence and Frida to the impressively large Castello di Maniace, founded in the 12th century. Thoughts and observations. During the writing of Women in Love, Lawrence became increasingly theosophical, allowing himself to be influenced by the pervasive interest in occultism and theosophy almost a preoccupation among intellectuals at the time. According to Whelan, Lawrence first became aware of theosophical and occult thought as early as 1908, but it was as late as 1917 that there are references to specific works that we know Lawrence read. It is common knowledge today that as far as artistic influences go, Lawrence's primary influences on women in love were primitivism and futurism. I claim, however, that these influences were foregrounded by his fascination with the esoteric, with symbology, theosophy, and the occult, and the concept of art as a religion which weaves itself as a thread throughout his entire thinking process in the germination of this work. It is indisputably apparent that Lawrence embodied Hegelian thought, which sought to revive Socratic philosophy as a definition of art, as that which was a product of new shapes of thought, and new shapes of consciousness other than or beyond socially constructed binary contradictions and categories. Lawrence was all for new shapes of consciousness, which required art to be submitted to a degree of violence in order to be able to reveal new sensuous imagination. In this presentation, I will not discuss the germination of Lawrence's fascination with primitivism. However, Jane Ellen Harrison's ancient art and ritual was certainly a huge influence on Lawrence and his development of women in love. In fact, his particular choice to treat primitive art together with futurist art in his Opus Manius was a reactionary influence he imports from Jane Harrison's text. In his letter to Arthur McLeod from Fiascherino, Lawrence mentioned how he loved Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy, but most of all art and ritual, which pleases me right now, he wrote claiming that he was fascinated to see art coming out of religious yearning. The text, which refers quite consistently to Fraser's The Golden Bow and his totemism and exogamy, set some of Lawrence's most identifiable positions on the ancient aspect of art. Jane Harrison clarifies, I quote, art as the handmaid of religion in relation to the daemon or spirit of the air, then as a full-blown divinity, end quote. Later in February 1916, however, Lawrence angrily read volume one of Petrie's History of Egypt, which he found very irritating, yet he claimed still it served. We find evidence of how it served in the copious direct Egyptian references in the Excurse chapter in Women in Love. In 1916, he also read Sir Edward Burnett Taylor's Primitive Culture, which Lawrence stated he preferred to the Golden Bow, or Gilbert Murray, referring to Murray's four stages of Greek religion. Now, Lawrence's chief source of Theosophist's works was Madame Helena Blavatsky, although as Tyndall has documented, he was familiar also with other contemporary Theosophists such as Annie Besant, Uspensky, Gurdjieff, and Rudolf Steiner. His major philosophical works after the crown are all consciously and explicitly Theosophical. The psychology constructed by Lawrence in Psychoanalysis and the Unconscious and Fantasy of the Unconscious 
is based on the esoteric doctrine of chakras that he found in Blavatsky and in her friend James Price's The Apocalypse Unsealed. The theosophists of Lawrence's time, Jane, James Morgan Price, Helena Blavatsky, Annie Besant, and Eliphas Le Levi strongly believed that civilization was in fact on a steady decline. And modernist icons such as William Butler Yeats, Lawrence himself, Gertrude Stein, and T.S. Eliot, among others, took inspiration from Madame Blavatsky's writings and her investigations of the Vedantic tradition, most especially from her Manus Opus, The Secret Doctrine, published as early as 1888 and soon after the key to theosophy in 1889. The theosophists were half visionary, half spurious movement that Blavatsky and others had launched in New York in 1875. Theosophy, according to Blavatsky, was synonymous with inner knowledge and eternal truth. Artists such as Piet Mondrian took to the vigor of Theosophy's assault on materialism in the name of higher truth, as did Marcel Duchamp, Kazimir Malevich, and Kandinsky. I got everything from the secret doctrine, Mondrian wrote in 1918. Eastern theology was a means by which modernists revivified Western religious traditions, as it was through Theosophy that a number of important modernist figures first became aware of Eastern traditions and found rich material for new cultural production. The modernist fascination with images and symbols as a gateway into a magical territory became at once themselves this territory. The symbolist movement led by Verlaine, Rimbaud, Mallarmé and Simmons were the precursors to the modernist key interfaces between art and literature, as well as to direct influences on the seminal work of Yeats and Lawrence. Now, when Blavatsky died in 1891, Annie Besant took over the leadership of the Theosophical Society together with Colonel Olcott and three years later met Charles Leadbeater. In fact, what we know today as Kandinsky's style and his trademark controlled explosions of color bear a striking resemblance to images that appear in Annie Besant's and Charles Webster Leadbeater's 1905 taught forms clearly a major impact on Kandinsky's thinking when he wrote his Concerning the Spiritual in Art in 1908. His paintings can be viewed as opaque sacred emblems, conduits of spiritual revolution, of new shapes of consciousness. On the Spiritual in Art is, after all, a treatise on the aesthetics of painting and a good many of what appear to be purely aesthetic observations about form, color, and spatial relationships are similarly derived from theosophical pronouncements. The writings of Blavatsky, Besant, and other thinkers influenced by theosophy are worth, worthy of attention in their own right. However, these texts ought to be read as a powerful contribution to artists and thinkers in a wide variety of fields. Many painters and writers, including the futurists themselves, were now fascinated by these theosophical teachings on new shapes of consciousness, on thought forms, and the correlation between vibrations, color, and sound, and how these influenced their work, relying less and less on form. Shape, line, and color became the main tools for creating visible images of unseen events in the astral world. Kandinsky, for one, quoted Blavatsky's The Key to Theosophy in writing about the methods used by primitive and ancient cultures in dealing with matters that could not be explained by materialistic science. Besant did, in fact, visit Casa Kuzeni in May 1912. Together with Charles B. Bita, Jiddu Krishnamurti, his brother and Besant's ward Jiddu Nityananda, George Arendale and Jean Arja Daza. Lawrence knew Besant, and in a letter to Mountsier, he writes that he met her on the SS Orsova on the way from Ceylon to Perth on the 24th of April 1922. At Casa Cuseni, there is a strong spirit of place for the forward thinking drive of the futurists and their capacity to capture all the elements of nature. Symbiotically sit side by side emblems from the word of theosophy, the esoteric, such as references to, to Kabbalah, which were also very influential in Lawrence's time. Casa Kuzeni became a locus amenus for modern thinking, for philosophy, art, literature, and the real place where the art seemed to have synthesized. My initial interest was to find out whether anything in his visit to this house may have inspired Lawrence in his work primarily in my research on women in love. However, the timings were all wrong. By the time Lawrence arrived in Taormina, he wrote to Cot on the 9th of March, 1920, women in love has gone to print in America. It became immediately evident to me 
that Lawrence and his women in love seem to proleptically anticipate much of what Casa Cuseni represents. What studying the timeline, when studying the timeline, it might appear that Lawrence had been synthesizing at the very same time as Casa Cuseni was. At Casa Cuseni in Tarmina, Lawrence may have found a confirmation to his concerns and his liminal ambivalent positions of art, religion, and his own brand of theosophy. However, the most important finding of all, which highly contributes to my research, is the information which undeniably confirms that Lawrence was indeed writing at a time when the literary and artistic milieu was moving at such a fast pace that the output was only perhaps a symptom or byproduct of the rich, fertile aesthetic development of the time. To me, on a personal level, Casa Cuseni is an architectural representation of what Women in Love achieves as a novel and what Lawrence himself epitomized. I will end as I began by a reading from Women in Love towards the end of the novel is an excerpt that came to me on walking through the garden. In this excerpt, Birkin is broken by the death of Gerald Cry. I quote from page 479. It was very consoling to Birkin to think this. If humanity ran into a cul-de-sac and expended itself, the timeless creative mystery would bring forth some other being, finer, more wonderful, some new, more lovely race to carry on the embodiment of creation. The game was never up. The mystery of creation was fathomless, infallible, inexhaustible forever. Races came and went, species passed away, but ever new species arose, more lovely or equally lovely, always surpassing wonder. The fountainhead was incorruptible and unsearchable. It had no limits. It could bring forth miracles. Utter, create utter new races and new species in its own hour, new forms of consciousness, new forms of body, new units of being. To be man was as nothing compared to the possibilities of the great created mystery. To have one's pulse beating directly from the mystery, this was perfection, unutterable satisfaction. Human or inhuman mattered nothing. The perfect pulse throbbed with indescribable being miraculous unborn species. As I walked through, I could not help but think that this garden seemed to represent Lawrence himself, multifaceted, synergetic, syncretic, and iconoclastic. The house also confirmed to me the extent to which Lawrence in Women in Love had indeed been prophetic and proleptic synthesizer. He was a metatextuality of his own time. To end this presentation, I would like to read out to you an excerpt from the first chapter of C.N. Sardinia titled As Far as Palermo, in which Lawrence describes walking down steps to the village of Taormina, the main thoroughfare of which, the Corso, the main road, he mentions in the following paragraph. Very dark under the great carob tree, as we go down the steps, dark still the garden, scent of mimosa, and then of jasmine, the lovely mimosa tree invisible, dark stony path, the goat whinnies out of her shed, the broken Roman tomb which lolls right over the garden track does not fall on me as I slip under its massive tilt. Ah, dark garden, dark garden, with your olives and your wine, your medlars and mulberries and many almond trees, your steep terraces ledged high above the sea. I am leaving you slinking out, out between the rosemary hedges, out of the tall gate, onto the cruel steep stony road. So under the dark big eucalyptus trees over the stream and up towards the village, there I have got so far. I like to think that Lawrence here describes the descent from Casa Cuseni. But this of course is just me fussing about Lawrence's bagatelle. Thank you.